time, Ms. Hottie from Olympian High School, I'll be using the Traditions and Encounters textbook to help you learn about Chapter 12, the cross-cultural exchanges on the Silk Road. So basically the Silk Roads in the classical era. Keep in mind that you need to know everything that you've learned on the classical era, which we will define as 600 BCE to 600 CE. Not to be confused with how the book describes it because the book says it's 500 BCE to 500 CE, but we use the periodization of the College Board. So you need to remember everything you've learned so far from chapters seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. And if you've forgotten, then you need to go back and review. This chapter assumes that you know about those previous chapters so that when it makes a reference to say the Hellenistic empires, you know what they are. You know that they're the states that came to be after Alexander of Macedon dies. And you should know who Alexander of Macedon is. I'm not going to reteach that. You can go back and learn it. But Alexander of Macedon dies, right? And he, after he dies, his empire gets split up into the Antigonid, which is what we think of as Greece, Egypt. And you have over here the Seleucid Empire, which actually could be counted as both a Persian Empire and as a Hellenistic Empire because it's technically ruled over by a Greek Macedonian uh, group um, of Seleucus and his crew, but it's also in Persia. So that's why when we learned Chapter 7, the uh, Persian Empires, we learned this acronym Aunt Sally Park Sassy, Aunt Sally Park Sassy, those four. And that stood for Achaemenids, Seleucids, this one. Okay, Parthians and then Sassanids, but you had to remember that the Seleucids weren't actually Persian. Originally, they were from basically Greece, Macedon area. Yeah. Okay, so because you know that, we can move on, but make sure that you do know that. And if you don't, you may need to go back to the chapters and relearn them. You need those chapters to do well. Okay, I'm going to move my face for a second so that we can jump into the chapter. Okay, so there's a, an interesting vignette. The vignette is about a traveler who's traveling for diploma, diplomatic reasons, uh, sent by Han Wudi from Han, China. His name is Zhang Qian, and he's looking for people to become allies with the Han dynasty against their Han enemy, the Shan Yu. And it talks to you about how he gets captured twice in doing this, but that ultimately this is going to lead to the beginnings or the formation of trade networks with people to the west of China and help contribute to the opening of the Silk Roads, which is described in your book as a network of trade routes that linked lands as distant as China and the Roman Empire and led to the establishment of relations between China and lands to the west. So there's going to be a lot of other effects of the trade that's taking place during the classical period. So you want to pay attention to words like fostered, enabled, encouraged, facilitated. Those are all words that are letting you know that it led to something else. And so it's going to lead to things like the fostering of communications, the facilitation of trade, facilitate to make it easier. Um, it's going to lead to uh, the spread of religions and of diseases, which will ultimately bring down many of these classical empires. So look for words like this, like promoted, fostered, enabled, encouraged. These are all words when you're reading that should be a wake up call to you. This is a historical thinking skill. It's talking about cause and effect. And it's going to tell you that they're going to mix sometimes peacefully, sometimes violently with their neighbors. And there will be become a larger, broader network of communication and exchange that you'll be reading about. And this is going to change the life and the experience of people alive at that time. Remember, it's going to enable them to do other kinds of economic activities since they don't have to worry about producing everything they need. They can concentrate on the things that they're good at making and then just import the things that they uh, need that they don't make well. It's going to facilitate the spread of uh, disease and of religion. And it's, um, again, kind of going to have a long-term effect on the survival of those classical societies as they get rocked by disease. Okay, so we get to this section, Long Distance Trade and the Silk Roads. The biggest takeaway from this section is that it's going to become safer to trade during the classical times. The first paragraph describes to you how before classical times, it was actually quite dangerous to trade because uh, the, in the old days, the ancient days, the societies were small and there's a far distance to traverse between one society and the other, right? So there's a long distance between them. So while it might be safe in this society and safe in this society, because you had to travel the distance between them and there was no state there, you could get, you know, killed or, or your goods taken by bandits or pirates. But two developments are going to make it safer to travel during during the classical period. One of those things is that the rulers of states in the classical empire are going to invest in infrastructure like roads and bridges. Now, they're not doing it for the merchants. They're doing it to facilitate controlling those areas or to move their militaries, but it has the secondary effect 
of facilitating exchange for merchants and allowing them to trade. The second thing that's going to happen is that there's going to be larger states developed. So instead of having to traverse this entire distance between one state and the other, because they're bigger, let's say they're bigger, I can't even do it, but there, there's less distance between one state and the other that's unsafe. So that generally makes it safer because they pacified or made peaceful larger stretches of land. Okay, so we're going to get to next talking before we talk about the Silk Roads, we'll talk about the early trade networks of the Hellenistic era. Again, a reminder that Hellenistic refers to the time period after the fall of Alexander the Great and when these empires were around. So the Antigonid, the Ptolemaic, and the Seleucid. So the Seleucid, again, double dips. It's in chapter 10 and it's in chapter 7. It's technically controlled by people who were like descent, you know, from Alexander's region, from Macedon and Greece, but it's in Persia. And these Hellenistic empires do quite a lot to contribute to the fostering of trade networks, largely because they established colonies. So when Alexander was alive, he built many colonies, and so did the Seleucids. And I'm sure you remember learning about in chapter seven how trade really was encouraged by Greek colonists who would trade back and forth between what we think of tra as traditional Greece, of course it wasn't just a state back then, and the Seleucid Empire, this one right here. So um, that is going to link or connect trade between the Seleucid region and uh, the Mediterranean basin. And this tells you about all the evidence that they found, all these physical remains that include Greek style structures and buildings that show us that there were in fact Greek communities in Persia and Bactria Remember, Bactria is what we think of as Afghanistan slash Pakistan today. Okay, the Ptolemies also encouraged trade. Um, they're going to trade to the south. It's going to tell you that they're trading with the kingdoms of Nubia. So they're trading south. So here they are. One of their major uh, trade networks is Alexandria, but the book also mentions to you another important trade network, uh, a port being Berenice. So you should probably write that down in your notes. And another really important thing that helps people during the Hellenistic era trade in the Indian Ocean is acquiring knowledge of the, in, of the monsoon winds from the Indian and Arab traders that they interacted with. So basically there's this pattern to how the winds move. Uh, and so monsoons are winds that bring rain and knowledge of how the winds move is going to enable or allow the mariners to travel more safely and avoid a shipwreck. So basically in the summer they blow from the southwest and in the winter they blow from the northeast. So you basically have to time your trip so that you're not going against the wind. And so this is really important knowledge or information that is going to facilitate trade. So this is really a big deal. It's important and should be put it inside an inspect chart if you're taking one. Okay, so this is an expensive uh, thing to do to maintain trade routes for the states, but it's worth it. It's going to pay dividends. It's going to be worthwhile because they can do things like levy taxes. That basically means just collect taxes or collect like a fee on the things that are foreign products being traded in their goods. And that's sometimes what the Hellenistic rulers did. It's also going to stimulate economic development within the Hellenistic empires themselves. Trade in the Hellenistic world brought all kinds of exciting goods from different parts of the empire. So it's going to describe to you how spices, pepper, cosmetics, gems, and pearls came from India. Uh, it's grain from Persia and Egypt. Uh, from the Mediterranean, you have wine, olive oil, jewelry, jewelry, works of art, and a brisk or active trade in slaves, often who were kidnapped against their will or prisoners of war. So these are all some of the commodities that are being traded during the Hellenistic period. And it's going to not just link parts of, you know, Asia and, and Europe, but also to North Africa. And in North Africa, a really important port that emerges as the principal or most important commercial center on the East African coast is a port called Rapta. You need to write this in your notes. In 2016, I read an article that said that archaeologists believe they had finally found where Rapta probably was because your book says that they don't know where it is still, that it was probably near Dar es Salaam. So the article that I read argued that it was probably near a place called Mafia Island, but I don't know if it's 100% agreed by all historians and archaeologists that, that that is where Rapta actually was. But we know it was somewhere around Tanzania. Um, and there, they're going to exchange a lot of iron goods in exchange for 
uh, ivory, rhinoceros, horned tortoise shell, and slaves that they're getting from beneath them, from the, from the lower regions. So as you can see, this is going to foster economic organization and the emergence of states and interaction, all of these things. So all of these areas are going to be connected through trade. And that brings us to the next topic, which is the Silk Roads. But at least you know sort of what it was like before you have the emergence of the Silk Roads themselves. You have this beginnings of a larger network of trade and exchange.